Jesus used to tell stories about treasuring the kingdom of heaven more than anything else in this world. I want to tell a modern day version of the story he tells in Matthew chapter 13. It goes kind of like this. So let's say there's a couple in Arizona, they want to get out of the heat, and so they book an Airbnb in San Diego. And they drive to San Diego, and it's this old Victorian, actually it's like a hundred year old house they managed to find on Airbnb. And when they get there, it's nice out, and they want to go surfing or at least find boogie boards. So they start going through the house looking for boogie boards. They end up in a base, the basement. It has a basement. And uh, the husband looks in the closet but can't find anything in the closet. But before he closes the door, he sees a pile of boxes. Before that, it, behind that, it looks like there's another door. So he moves the boxes, and he forces this door open. It hasn't been opened in decades, maybe. And when he opens it, there's a pile of cold, hard cash. And he calls his wife over, and they pull out a wad of $100 bills, and they're all dated 1943. Somebody had stashed these during World War II, and they're still there. He says, he looks, and there's got to be a million dollars in cash here. And she says, what are we going to do now? He says, we're going to take it. And she says, no, that's stealing. He says, well, obviously the homeowners don't know it's here. They'd put it in the bank. If, if they don't know it's here and we take it and they don't even know they own it, that's not stealing. She says, yes, it's still stealing. We're not taking it. He says, well, then what do you suggest we do? She says, how about we buy the house? And he goes, well, we don't. How can we do that? We, we live in Arizona. We can't afford the house. Otherwise, we'd all be living in San Diego, wouldn't we? And uh, he, she, he, and, and, and she says, well, we got to try. So they come back to Gilbert, sell their house, sell their cars, sell their bicycles, sell the cats, ev- not, not the cats, sell everything of value and uh, scrap together enough for a down payment. And they buy the house and the treasure is theirs. And Jesus says, that's how it should be. It's worth, the the treasure in heaven is worth giving up everything you possess on earth. I mean, give that up 10 times over. That's how valuable the kingdom of heaven is. So all of this starts in his manifesto, his kingdom manifesto. We've been going through this series we titled Kingdom Living. This is our last Sunday. So let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what he says about treasure and the right kind of treasure. He says, verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moths and dust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasure in heaven. And that's his challenge there. The the thing is, Jesus knows that everybody treasures something. That Jesus knows it's part of our human nature to grab onto and to hold onto treasure. And he's saying, treasure the right things. What is a treasure in this world? A treasure would be anything that you value, anything that you keep and protect, anything that you work to get a hold of, anything, something that you want deeply, that's a treasure. And Jesus says, be very careful what you treasure. Treasure eternal things. But the problem is, let's be honest here, all of us, feel really bad about ourselves if we're broke. We need some treasure in our life, don't we? Because when you're broke, if you don't have money, you feel weak and you feel worthless. I I know this because I've been broke. I, I, I lived that way for years because I know how, what it feels because I was a youth pastor and youth pastors don't make enough to pay rent. And that's a fact. When Veronica and I first got married, I was a youth pastor in uh, the L.A. area, and I still remember the first week that she went to get groceries, I had come up with a budget, and I was taking marriage seriously, so I had this budget, everything was budgeted out because we weren't going to be able to make rent, and uh, so I said, you got $25 for, for, the, for the week. She said, I can't buy a week's worth of groceries with $25, and I said, oh, hang on, I'll come with you, and I'll show you how. I didn't know Jack about shopping, but I went with her. And she would put things in, and I would take it out. And she put in, like, Rice Krispie. I said, hang on. We can go generic. Let's go store brand crispy rice at Albertsons. We'll go crispy. I didn't know. It's like chewing on gravel. You know, you'll chip a tooth eating crispy rice. But we put that in. We get to the checkout counter. We stay at $25.00. We're out of food by Wednesday, okay? And she's going back. I never went back with her again. That didn't work. But when we don't have money 
It's a bad feeling. We feel like we're worthless. We feel weak. We feel embarrassed and ashamed. And it doesn't even matter that our friends or our neighbors don't know that we're broke. But when you go to the ATM and it says you only have $18 in the bank, you feel like you're worth $18. And I want to start with this foundational principle, and it's this, that your identity is not tied to what you own or how much you have. You are worth so much more, infinitely more than any possession or any amount of money. So look back with me at, or let's look back at Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. And Jesus says this, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you'll eat or drink or what you'll wear, he says. Uh, Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And so he establishes this principle that your identity is not tied to what you have. It's not tied to possessions or any amount of money. Here's how... uh, The Message Bible reads Matthew 10. What's the price of a pet canary? Some loose change, right? And God cares what happens to it. He pays even greater attention to you. So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. How do you like that? But Jesus knows that there's a fundamental connection. This is why he talks about treasure. Jesus knows there's a fun- fundamental connection between money and possessions and our spirituality, between how we view and handle money and our resources and our soul. He knows there's a connection. When you, when you read the Gospels, he gets, keeps giving us reminders of this. I'll just share a couple from Luke just as examples. Luke chapter 12, he talks about a man who has these barns and he fills them up with grain and they're stuffed. They're absolutely full. He's been stockpiling for for years, enough for the next 10 years. And Jesus says this, but what the man doesn't know as he stands proudly in front of his barns is that tonight his life will be taken from him. And then he says, what good is it if you gain the whole world, but you forfeit your soul? He makes a connection between possessions and his spiritual condition. And... um, In Luke chapter 18, we read about this very affluent man, very successful man, comes to see Jesus, and he says, I want to follow you. I want the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus knows that he values his possessions. So he says, go sell everything you have and everything you own, give it away to the poor, and then come and follow me. The man can't do it again. Jesus makes a connection between his possessions and where his soul is, what his spiritual condition is. Luke chapter 19, we read about Zacchaeus. You know Zacchaeus well. Jesus goes to his house for dinner and he says if you want to follow me you've got to give away you've got to reimburse everyone who you've ripped off for the last dozen years however long it's been so Zacchaeus goes out and he and he pays back everyone twice what he owed them and he comes and he tells Jesus I've given back more than what I owed everyone and then Jesus says this Matthew chapter 19 salvation has come to this house What does Jesus do? He draws a straight line from how Zacchaeus handles his money and possessions and the condition of his soul. And so Jesus establishes in Matthew chapter 6 that we need to be very careful about stockpiling and owning because it can grab our heart. Here's a key idea that I have for you. Take this thought home with you. There's a a powerful connection exists between our spirituality and how we value money and possessions. And Jesus says, treasure eternal things most, the things that last, the things that really live on forever. That's the challenge that I want to start with um, this morning. Because how we handle money and possessions is not just important. It affects our spiritual condition. And Jesus knows that our human tendency is to treasure possessions and money more then we treasure God. So he says this. I have several observations I want to make, and here's the first one. And he, so he says, be very careful what you treasure because our hearts tend to follow our treasure. So let's go back to our text. We're in Matthew chapter 6. I want to read uh, starting at verse 19 again, and this time we read, uh, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Move down to verse 21, where thieves break in and steal. Verse 21 Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
Do you see this? So the things that you treasure, it will suck your heart right after and your soul right after will follow that. Uh, possessions, think about this with me, have a way of controlling us. Possessions have a way of owning us. I know it's true because it's happened to me. It happened at Lowe's. I'll just tell you what happened. Yeah, <laughs> you ever go to Lowe's uh, to buy light bulbs and then you like you end up on the power tool aisle? So that's what happened. I'm, I'm at Lowe's to get light bulbs and and I end up on the power tool aisle. I I, I think it was a shortcut to the to the light bulbs, but I'm there just perusing the power tools, and I see that they have a skill. That skill with one Elsa for. $39. I'm like, what? I need one of these because I had this cheap black and decker that it seized on me like two years before and I couldn't cut anything at home. And, 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 and so I thought, man, I need this skill saw, but I'm here to get light bulbs. So I stuck with a plan, stayed disciplined, went to the light bulb aisle, found the light bulbs. But going back to the counter, the shortest way back to the counter was through the power tool aisle. So I stopped and I'm looking at it. It's got red handles. So I thought, let me just pick it up. And it felt good, a lot more solid, like well-built. And I, I thought these skills were over $100, but you're talking $39 as opposed to a Black & Decker for like $34? I'm, are you kidding me? So I was like, I, I need this. And, and even though I hadn't thought that much about it, it's like it's free at $39. This is like free. So I took it with the light bulbs, checked out. And as I'm driving home, I started to think, okay, what needs to be cut at home? Because obviously... <laughs> If I own a skill saw, you got to start cutting things. Something needs to be cut. But I get home, and I park in the garage. I don't see anything. Come in the house. I can't see anything that needs to be cut in the house. But I'm standing in our family room, and I look outside, and I see our concrete block wall. And then it hits me. I know what needs to be cut. Because I've watched HGTV, and now they're putting these accent walls and backyards out of wood, horizontal lumber. And it looks like mid-century modern. And uh, so I called my wife over. I said, hey, we need a wood accent wall back here. And she says, why? We already have a wall. And I said, well, you don't understand. If you watch HGTV, you know that they say that you need 30% 30, 30 of your backyard should be grass, 30% is hardscape, and 30% should be wood. And I said, we don't even have 1% wood, so we need some wood, some lumber to cut. And she says, okay, but is this going to be expensive? I said, oh, man, two by sixes are like five bucks each. But I didn't know I need several, many dozens of two by sixes when I started this project. So, um, and, and, and so I, I go down to Lowe's, pick up now piles of lumber, get my nephew over because this was a big project now, it had grown on me. And so he stands there and he says, and I explained the project to him, the scope of what's happening. He says, so let me get this right. You have a concrete block wall and you're gonna put a wood wall right in front of it. And I said, man, you don't understand. Uh, uh, feng shui, do you? And uh, let me just explain to you, this 33% you know, of the yard needs to be wood. So with his lack of understanding, we moved ahead. And I, we finished it like 30 feet across, and it looks stunning. I'm, just, I'm not going to lie to you right now. And, uh, but then my twin brother that next weekend comes over to visit, and he walks in the backyard. He goes, ooh, I really like your accent wall here. But he says, Palmer, you got to do the whole backyard. <laughs> and uh, my wife banned me from going to Lowe's. So, so that project is on hold. It's just kind of frozen in time. We just have the accent wall. But you have had that happen to you. You know it, that our possessions have this way of owning us and sucking us in. And so Jesus says, uh, says this, verse 21, that's why he says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Your heart will follow your stuff. You know, most of us convince ourselves that if something grabs my heart, I'll give money to it. My, my money will follow my heart. But Jesus is right. He's smarter than the rest of us. He knows the state of the human heart, and he knows that our heart follows what we treasure. And, and Jesus says, be very careful with what you treasure, because not only will it grab your heart, but it will end up shaping you. So for example, if you, if you treasure money, then your life will be shaped by greed and by acquiring things. If, if you treasure power, then your life will be shaped by, by uh, manipulation. 
and by manipulating people. If you treasure possessions, then your life will be shaped by acquiring things. Uh, that's just how it works. Be very careful where your heart goes because it will shape who you are. And so I want to share this next thought with you from the passage because I said our hearts follow our treasure. And then Jesus says, you have to have a choice. You must make a choice. So let's look at uh, verse 24 in Matthew chapter 6. And we read, no one can serve two masters, Jesus says. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You have a choice. We all have a choice. You have to choose what you treasure, and you can't treasure both, Jesus says, at the same time. And every day, you make dozens of treasure choices. If you want to know where your heart is going, maybe it's as easy as looking at your visa statement or looking at your chase statement. Just read that. And maybe that will tell you where your heart has been. You'll have a couple of important things on there. Rent, mortgage, then Target, 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 Dunkin' Donuts, Target. You know, it's, it's just going to look like that if, you, if you're wondering where it goes. And it doesn't matter if we can afford the things that are at Target or Lowe's because we all carry this card of, I, I, you know, some call it a credit card or a debit card, but really it's the magic card of wonder and desire. <laughs> because, because with this magic card of wonder and desire, there's no limit to what you can have. I mean, sure, do you have it in the bank? Does it really matter? Because you'll just pay for it later. I know I'm going to get a raise next month or next year. Heck, you know, I know somebody's going to die in the family and I'll be able to pay this off one day. Mine is blue. But here's the thing, it, most of these sparkle and come in really great colors, like silver's good, but gold, mm, it's even better, or black, what, or, or platinum, that, it's, if you have one of those, there's absolutely nothing stopping you. But the trouble with the magic card of wonder and desire is now, the average American spends 110% of their income. The average American in credit card debt alone owes $16,748. The average American at the end of one year will spend over $1,000 just in credit card interest. And that's why maybe the Old Testament writers used to talk about debt and they connected it to slavery. And so you have to be very careful where you put your money. And then Jesus says you have this choice. Be careful. It will grab onto your heart. And I said before that your heart follows your treasure. You see, the things that we invest in, let's just talk about our money. The places we put our money and our resources, let alone our time, our heart will be there. Our thoughts and our emotional energy will be there. I'll just use this as an example. Let's say you're really smart, smarter than me, and you bought Amazon when it was still under $100 a share. I wish I had. I did not. Now, it just tipped the scale of $1,000 a share. The thing is, probably, if you've owned Amazon over the last six months, I'm thinking you're thinking about it and looking, checking the price of it every day. Because Amazon right now in Australia, they're flying drones around delivering packages. When they start doing that in the US, it's all over. It'll be $2,000 a, a share. I just read last week that Amazon acquired Whole Foods. Now they're gonna start putting grocery stores out of business the same way they put Sears and Kmart out of business. And so if you've owned Amazon, I'm, I'm just guessing, you're probably obsessed with every news report on the economy because it's affecting the, the price of your stock. So I wanna challenge you with this. Maybe you start to invest somewhere else and see if your heart and your emotional energy and your attention goes there. Sometimes I hear people say this, they'll say, I wish I had more of a heart for missions, or I wish I had more of a heart for the inner city poor. I wish I had more of a heart for the immigrant poor in our community. Then can I challenge you? Just say, start to invest there. Start to put your money and your resources and your time there. I'll promise you this. For example, we have a team in Malawi, like Scott said, and one of my closest friends, Chris Clark, runs an orphanage there, Children of the Nations. What if you start to sponsor a children of the nation's child? Now, every month, as you're writing a check, 
you're thinking about this child. And her, 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 her name's Sayutsu. And, and now she's writing you notes every other month. And at Christmas time, you're not thinking about your Amazon stock. You're thinking about where you're going to get Sayutsu for Christmas. And you're buying her gifts. And then you get to fly there next summer and visit her. And you start thinking about this for nine months. All of a sudden, your energy goes there. And so if you want your heart to be in the places that you say you want it to be, then start to invest there. Invest in things like Exodus Road. Exodus Road is, is, is working to end the sex trafficking of girls and young women in Southeast Asia and in the U.S. too. And your heart will go there and your heart, and you will be a part of ending that. Or invest in this church. Maybe you're not a giver here yet, but we want your heart. And so it starts by giving, and it starts by being generous here. Jesus says you have to choose what you treasure. And when you make that, when you make that choice, then all of a sudden your heart follows. In verse 21, uh, we, there's just this really stunning line that I want to read to you. Stockpile, this is from the Message Bible, stockpile treasure in heaven. Jesus says treasure eternal things because they're the only thing that lasts. It's the only thing that will last. Maybe you have a crazy uncle who has said this. You've heard him say this. Uh, you, you'll never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Why does your crazy uncle say that? Because you can't take it with you. That's what he'll tell you. J.D. Rockefeller was maybe the most uh, wealthy person who's ever lived on planet Earth. When he died, someone asked his accountant, so how much did he leave behind? And his, and his accountant gave a very precise accounting answer. His accountant said, all of it. <laughs> and this is what Jesus is saying here. Don't treasure stuff on Earth. You can't take it with you. This principle has been around for thousands of years. In 1922, an archaeologist by the name of Howard Carter, he's in Egypt, and he discovers King Tut's burial chamber, King Tut's tomb. And when they, they don't just find the mummified King Tut. Do you know what they find? They find all of his most valuable possessions, possessions because the Egyptians believed you could take it with you. But 3,000 years later, Jesus is still right. All of the jewelry, all of the gold, all of the gems all of his favorite possessions were still there because you can't take it with you. So Jesus says, invest in eternal things. So, and treasure eternal things. So as I was thinking about this idea over the last couple of, of weeks, I thought, well, what does Jesus mean when he says treasure eternal things? So I started this list, and it's my eternal treasures list. Yours could be different, and maybe you want to add to this one. But I started with this. If, when Jesus says treasure eternal things, he's got to be first talking about treasure your relationship with God. Love God above everything else. And then I have no Christ uh, knowing Christ is maybe the most valuable treasure you will ever have as you live. Treasure other people. God put you here to love people in your neighborhood, in your work. Uh, treasure your sons and your daughters. Treasure your husband or your wife. Treasure your friends. Invest in them. And then do justice. One of Jesus' great call to all of us, something that lives on forever, something that we read in from every Old Testament writer is that we are called to do justice, show mercy, Micah 6, Amos 5. And then show others Jesus Christ. Talk about him. Explain who he is. Explain how he changes everything for eternity. And then finally I have here, serve everyone. Live generously. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe this is the best way to put it. Live simply so that you have the freedom to live more generously. If you live simply, simply then you can share more and be extravagantly generous. When I, when I say that, I, I think about in my life, I'm, most, I'm reminded most, uh, usually reminded of how much we have here when I leave the country. When I, when I live here, maybe I forget about how much we have, but it's when I go to other countries that I'm reminded of how much we have. I know that because when I went to Haiti for the first time, we were at the Good Neighbor Orphanage just a week after the, the earthquake, and Johnny, the orphanage director, is showing us around how these walls have been cracked and, and, and had fallen down. And then after looking around his orphanage that was, that was damaged badly, um, 
I walked across this little dusty road because I saw a two-story building that had collapsed, and it was a huge mess of concrete. And then as I, I walk around it, I see that there's a woman there cooking. And I said, was this your house? She said, yeah, I lived here with my relatives. And she had two little kids with her. I said, well, where are you living now? And she points at this little bed sheet square. So it's about the size of this carpet, four bed sheets, smaller than this carpet, with some plastic on top. I said, you're living in that? She said, yeah, there's five of us living here. And it just kind of broke my heart. And I, I, so I didn't have much in my wallet, but I gave her everything I had. But we were coming back 30 days later uh, because we we're going to help Johnny rebuild his orphanage. So the week before we got on the plane, I went down to Target. And I went in the sporting goods department and said, hey, I need your biggest tent. Because I thought if I take Rose, her name's Rosetta. I said, if I take Rosetta a tent, I thought, then that'll be much better than the bed sheet shelter she's trying to live in. And so the guy shows me a six-man tent. I said, wow, six grown men. Man, that's a big tent. And so I didn't open it up. I was in a hurry. So packed it, took the tent with me in a box. And so one afternoon, Tom Bright and I went over to Rosetta's place, and she's still living in this bed sheet dwelling. And I said, Rosetta, I brought you something better. I brought you a, a tent. And she looked real excited. She didn't know what it was. But Tom and I started to set up this green tent. It was bright green. And then as we set it up, I realized it was only about this tall and only about as big as this rug over here, and I felt so much shame. The box said six-man tent. It was like six preschooler tent is what it was. It wasn't six grown men. And I, and I felt shame because I wanted to give her, and she was, by the way, real excited, and it seemed like she loved it. And, but here's the thing. I knew I could have done better. I knew if I had gone to the right stores, I really could have found her something she could live in. The, the tent cost $55. I could have bought her 10 tents, and I don't have that much, but I could have done that. And, and I say all that to remind you that you have more than you think. You know, none of us in the East Valley, Chandler, Gilbert, Queen Creek, Tempe, wherever you live, Mesa, I'm sure you don't feel wealthy. And, and, and I know that no one sitting here this morning lives in opulence or luxury or excess but we have more than we need. We have, look in your garages, look in your closets, look in your storage units. We all have more computers, more shoes, more appliances, more power tools, more skill saws, more tents than we'll ever use in a lifetime. And if we start to live simply, if we, if we can learn to be content with what we already have and stop spending 110% of our income, then all of a sudden, you can be the generous person that you know God made you to be. I know you want to be generous. It's in your heart, but you haven't allowed yourself to. But be content with what you already have. And then settle with God that you will treasure people and start sharing what you have with, with others who are in need, whether it's right here in Chandler or whether it's as far away as Port-au-Prince. I want to leave you with a challenge. It's the dog days of summer, so I want to call this the 30 days of summer challenge. So here's my 30 days. Summer, you know what, and, and you, you think summer just started, but if you have kids in the Chandler Unified School District, it's almost over, all right? Summer's over like July 5th, they go back to school. It's pretty, it's like, okay, it's about 30 more days. In about a month, summer's over if you have kids. So this is a 30 days of summer challenge, and here's my challenge. I want to invite you for the next 30 days to give something away. And don't just give away your junk that you'll never need or don't even know you have. Find the things that you treasure. Maybe the things that have grabbed your heart, things that have grabbed your attention, your emotional energy. And then find someone who needs it. Uh, don't bring all your used clothes here and drop them off. No, I want you to be blessed. I want you, and, and maybe put some things on offer up and then use that money to sponsor a child with Children of the Nations or to get behind Exodus Road or Live Love or something like that. But over the next 30 days, start giving at least one thing away a day. And see, they say it takes about 30 days to form a habit. habit. My hope is by the end of 30 days, we all learn to live more simply and be more generous.